Well, I think we're live. Apologies for anyone who's been hanging around for a few minutes. We had a sudden internet shortage uh, like 10 minutes ago. We had been pretty organized until that point, and then everything became pretty frenzied. Happy New Year, one and all. Um, I'm sure most of us are delighted to see the back of 2020 and are fairly content in the knowledge that 2021 surely can't get too much worse. Hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas. Ours was predictably quiet, although thanks to certain people and housemates, not as quiet as, as uh, would have been suboptimal. Uh, it's a time of great upheaval and turmoil in the house. Just before Christmas, as I mentioned in the previous show, we lost our longest standing housemate, Anna. And as of tomorrow morning, our dear friend Andy, uh, oft referred to as Chief Marketing Director, will be returning to his native Australia um, forever. And that's been taking a, quite a toll on us the last few weeks. And also in this final week, we've been preparing some, some fun and games and lots of kind of special things for us to, to do to commemorate the last bit of our time together. A very inquisitive black cat looking at the cat cam, which is amazing. Um, so, a combination of the fresh start and the import of what tomorrow brings it meant that I wanted to play you my favourite piece uh, today um, Mussorgsky's Pictures at an Exhibition. Um, I was trying to rack my brains as to why pieces become so popular. Um, in this case, undoubtedly, it's because of the, the passion and the intensity displayed. There's also a number of good tunes. Um, but I think what's particularly touching about this work is the personal connection contained within. Uh, Mussorgsky was close friends with the artist and, and sculptor um, Alexander Hartmann. And they, between them, had been right at the forefront of kind of a new movement in Russia, slightly more of a nationalistic movement, putting Russian culture at the heart of their art and their music making. And Alexander had therefore been a, a, real, a real comrade of Mussorgsky in this transition. And in 1873, uh, Harman died very suddenly at the age of 39. And February of the next year, 1874, uh, Mussorgsky and a number of their other mutual friends put on a, an exhibition of some of Alexander's works, um, most of them visual paintings or drawings, um, but there are even some architectural sketches in there as well, which I'll come on to later. And it seems as if it was there at the exhibition when Mussorgsky was walking around Alexander's paintings that he was inspired to create this work, uh, a homage to the legacy of his dear friend. And I think, for me anyway, it's this very personal touch and therefore the intimacy and the love that's contained in so much of the music that gives it its power. We're looking at a work of pushing 40 minutes in length and with a number of different movements, technically 15, um, but some of the movements, as I'll explain in a minute, are repeated and come back more than once. It's weird, it's a piece that actually is better known in the public sphere as an orchestral piece. Um, it was orchestrated first by Rimsky-Korsakov, who was um, pretty much a contemporary of Mussorgsky, um, but then later by the French composer Maurice Ravel, and it's this version that is most often played in concert halls by orchestras. Um, it's a wonderful orchestration. Um, I don't think anyone could conceivably have done it better. However, for me, it misses the essence of another reason why this piece is so magnificent, is that this piece is enormous, uh, Herculean, muscular, uh, all-encompassing. And when all those things need to be sought just out of one of these black boxes, the impression, the sense of struggle is so much greater. Stick uh, an orchestra the size of 60 people on it and suddenly it feels quite effortless. So a little bit about the structure. 
he employs an interesting structure. So we've got lots of little movements. This is very much in the style of, I would say probably Schumann was the composer who, who started this idea. And you'll have maybe heard the Kinderzähnen of a few weeks ago, um, of having lots of little movements, little character pieces, not particularly long. They range anything from one to, I would say, five minutes each. Uh, but very, very quickly establishing an amazingly clear character and mood and setting and scene. But then he tweaks it in a more ingenious narrative way. So we begin with the promenade, and the promenade is probably the most famous theme from all of the work. It's a very simple theme, and it goes thus. A single line and then fully orchestrated. And this is repeated, well, many times. Um, and the whole point of this promenade is that it is the protagonist, it is Mussorgsky himself. This is him literally walking between the paintings at the exhibition. And so we get this lovely feeling of at one point getting lost in the art and the story of each painting and then coming back to the individual wandering between them. And what's also really cool is that every time he brings the promenade back, it's different. It's never the same twice. And so we get a real feeling that his mood and his emotions are changing based on the art that he's seen. Or even a couple of times we can see, sorry, we can hear him see the next painting before he's got to it. And the music of the next painting permeates and uh, influences the last few bars of the preceding promenade. It's a really outstanding uh, device. So Alexander Hartmann had been traveling quite a lot just before his death. Um, and there's consequently a very international feel to this work. Um, you'll notice uh, in the description I've put all the titles and uh, Maestro Bobby Kay, who is beautifully back in prime position today, will be steering you through those titles on the screen, impeccably, I'm sure, uh, as we go. And you'll see in many of the titles that they're in foreign. They're in a foreign language. Um, something which I'm, I'm hoping we can still embrace, despite the fact we're no longer in the EU. Um, so the first one we come to is Il Vecchio Castello. Um, this is the old castle, and this is a scene of a, a troubadour standing under the walls of this, this impressive building uh, by moonlight uh, and singing what feels to me like quite a lonely song. Uh, what's so special, I think, about this movement is the bass note, so the lowest note that I play, stays the same for the whole movement, and it's about five minutes. We call this a pedal note, and it gives the piece this real kind of anchoring heaviness, because as the harmonies move above it, the bass keeps us tethered down. Next one that we have is also with um, an international feel. We are suddenly in the Tuileries Gardens in Paris and Mussorgsky is showing us children quarrelling after their play. I think what's very telling about the first half of this work, the whole piece, is that it's quite light-hearted. It's uh, very effervescent, there's lots of cute, sweet, charming scenes and I'll come on in a bit to how that flips on its head uh, for the second half. So we hear the children teasing and playing and, and crying and whinging. Even more kind of complaining here. The next movement is simply called bidwo, which is a Polish word. Um, and it means cattle. And this is the depiction of an incredibly uh, old, rickety, cumbersome ox cart being dragged by oxen along a, a, a pretty rough dirt road. And the way Mussorgsky finds the heaviness here is by putting the left hand very, very low down at the bottom of the piano with thick chords. So we get this incredibly um, opaque 
muddy texture. This builds to an enormous climax as the as the cart rolls by and then fades away right into the distance. Um, the ballet of the unhatched chicks in their shells is, I think, one of the most effective of all the movements and one of the ones that requires the least explanation. We can hear them pecking, we can hear them uh, kind of busying themselves around the yard, um, and we can also hear them attempting to flap their wings. <laughs> The next one has a particularly strong connection to Mussorgsky um, because he owned this painting. And it's worth remembering that a vast, uh, a vast number of the paintings in this exhibition were owned by the people who put on the exhibition. So there's another reason for this very strong connection. The next one is, is a, a scene taken from another Polish town that Hartmann had visited, a place called Sandomirsz. And this is a depiction of two Polish Jews, one rich and one poor. And this is almost like something out of a, a caricature operetta, in the sense that there are two very, very clear characters, one for the rich, one for the poor, and they each state their case. And then in the second half of the movement, they have a pretty fierce confrontation, the two characters. So the first one is very brusque and very uh, cold. The second one is much more plaintive, stammering and pleading. And then when they come together... There's a real sense of struggle as those two men collide. And the promenade that follows that one, so I've been skipping out a few of the promenades in my, in my uh, leading of you through this because they are the promenades, but the promenade after, of that, after that one is the, is the grandest, is the richest, is the most thickly orchestrated. And I feel like that has to be because Mussorgsky was so chuffed that he'd just seen his painting, the one that he owned, and therefore the one that probably he felt gave him the closest connection to his friend. After that, we're back in France. This is the marketplace at Limoges. And there is a subheading to this called The Great News. Now, what I love about this piece is you can tell by certain inscriptions that Mussorgsky put in the manuscript quite how personally involved he was with the music. And in the manuscript of this movement, he tells us what the great news is. He invents French characters who are chatting in the marketplace. He tells us they are, they are uh, disturbed by this, this great happening because one of their cows called the Fugitive has escaped and they're also not sure as to the exact veracity of this because uh, one of them who has a very big red nose, the colour of a peony, may be too drunk to be able to report events properly. This kind of detail is super unusual for a composer to be so explicit about in the manuscript, to really let us in to his mind and the, the writing is extraordinary. But lots of repeated notes, lots of clamour, lots of clatter that leads us via a huge roar up the piano into the sea change of mood that I was referring to earlier. So we suddenly are in the Roman catacombs in Paris and again another all these are places that Harvin visited on his European travels and the space and the resonance is, is deafening. Um, and the piece is punctuated by just individual ringing chords that overlap and blend with each other to create these echoey sounds. and sinister and this leads us straight into uh, the same movement but another subheading 
which says with the dead in a dead language. And in the score, he writes that in Latin as if to give it even more gravitas. And there is some more beautiful writing from Mussorgsky in the manuscript here where he says that amidst the glowing skulls of the catacomb, the dead uh, voice or face of his friend Alexander Hartmann beckons him closer and draws him in. And so we can see that, uh, well, the darkness is falling here. Uh, what's ingenious about this is this is the first time the promenade theme, which previously had only happened in the promenade movements, is now started to infect the other movements. And so although we're in the minor key here and there's this incredibly spooky tremolando in the top of the right hand, the left hand is doing the promenade theme. leads us into the penultimate movement. Baba Yaga is a, a, a character in Russian folklore, I guess fairly akin to our boogeyman. There's a witch um, flying around and snatching up humans and grinding up their bones and eating them. And she lives in a house that as it supports, as its foundations or above ground foundations, it has the legs of a chicken. So this movement is called The Hut on Fowl's Legs and it begins with spooky shudders intermittently spaced with some silence. So we've got a lot of suspense and then suddenly it picks up pace, the music starts to roar and eventually we're in the sky with her whir whirling around and hearing her shriek. The middle section is dominated Again, like in catacombs, by tremolos in the right hand, and very spooky, unsettling melody in the left hand. Another extraordinary cascade akin to the one at the end of the marketplace in Limoges brings us into the final movement, the Great Gate of Kiev. Now, this is the one that's based on the architectural drawings that I referred to, and Alexander Hartmann had produced these architectural drawings in response to a competition um, calling out for people to design a Great Gate in Kiev. What's um, bizarre, or I don't know, what, what makes the music even more extraordinary here is that uh, the architect's drawings barely saw the light of day in the sense that the competition was cancelled, never ran to fruition, and therefore, of course, the gate was never built. Um, so from architect's drawings, which, you know, let's be honest, are, are fairly crude and, and unpalpable, um, Mussorgsky creates the most incredible music. Um, the main theme is grand, spacious, rich, quite cinematic. And the way he writes for the left hand gives us the constant feeling of bells tolling. This music is twice interrupted by some plain chant singing. Um, possibly some monks, or it certainly, but it certainly feels very uh, religious based, and he marks it without expression. It's very, very touching. So that happens twice, and then the biggest bell of all begins to toll. And he sets this up fairly modestly with the left hand spanning the bottom, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, until an enormous cascading scale down the piano leads us into the most epic reinstatement of the main Gate of Kiev theme. And what he's also done ingeniously in the build-up to this is he's woven the promenade theme into the tolling bell build-up and so it feels as if the whole piece is uniting and coming together. 
This leads us into another epic stretching and broadening and, and increasing of space. And the music ends with a, well, some of the grandest, most awesome, literally awesome um, music that I've ever played. The only movement I missed out, and I, I missed it out because I got sort of sidetracked by the wacky European tour that he was going on, is the first one, which is called Nomus, and which was a picture of a nutcracker in the shape of a kind of homunculus. And you can hear the lopsided, slightly golem-esque nature in the main theme. cat and mouse as we enter these, I don't know, I always think of them as kind of halls of residence of this gnomish creature. And then every now and then he jumps out at us and surprises us. That's about it. I think um, what's common if you go to a concert of this um, piece is that in the programme they'll have printed uh, copies of the artworks so that you can see the art that the music is based on. Um, and of course if you Google the piece you can find all of those. Um, I normally, when I perform this, when I performed this back when performing in concerts was a thing, uh, didn't like um, the pictures to be put in the programme simply because, without being too uh, pretentious, uh, there isn't a, a great deal of, of uh, comparison in my eyes between the artistry of the, uh, the visual and the artistry of the music. What Mussorgsky has, has done is so extra, so beyond what's on the page, that I actually find it counter-inspiring to look at those before you see the music and you know the great gate of kiev being the best example of this that's just some line drawings that he's turned into this you know gargantuan thing so there we are um one man's homage to his uh, no longer with us friend and uh andy it doesn't feel like you're dying <laughs> but but i thought that was enough of a of a beautiful parallel for me to dedicate this to you now, uh, living with you these last 637 days <laughs> has been one of life's great honours and um, never, nothing will quite be the same again without having you around. It's been very special. Thanks, dude. And I'm going to have to find a new chief marketing director as well. <laughs> Devastating. On which note, there are tickets to be bought um, there's a link underneath the videos in the descriptions. Please, if you're enjoying the concert, this is my only concerts right now. I think at last count, I had lost about 60 concerts since the beginning of the first lockdown. So if you're enjoying this, please consider chucking in anything you can afford. And the thumb beckons. Like and subscribe. Please like and subscribe on the videos. Um, Maestro Bobby K is back. Wonderful. How was your Christmas, mate? Wonderful. Good? Not marvellous. It's a family. <laughs> yeah, sure. We, we just about coped in your absence. Gabby doing a sterling job. Katie's here. How's it going, Katie? <laughs> Katie's having a great time sketching in the corner. And Gabby's here, of course, manning the camera with panache. Gabby's been very much at the, at the heart of so much that we've... Um, so much of our fun and games that we've been preparing for, for friend Andy. And... Um, so we're all feeling a little drained, but uh, never too drained to play this belter of a piece. Enjoy. Hmm. You guys might want to um, bring up the... You might want to type it into Wikipedia so you have the movements in front of you. Um, the guys watching will get it because of the genius that is Robert Kvalek.
There we are. Yes. Oh, the piece is so cool. And um, yeah, something very touching about hearing a composer just kind of do something very personal, do something for his mate. Uh, yeah. I love the way, one I wanted to say before, I love the way in the promenade that we see immediately that Mussorgsky is not, does not take himself too seriously. And Mussorgsky had quite a troubled life. He had a big battle with alcoholism, which eventually killed him. And he was a very, very large man. And in the beginning of the promenade, the way he writes it is clearly in my opinion anyway, I think it's pretty clear, poking fun at that. Um, composers normally write in an, with an even number of beats in a bar because it gives us a feeling of symmetry. The main theme in the promenade is 11 beats, a 5 and a 6. So it's designed to have ra rather a grand and noble feeling, sure, but also a sort of lumbering kind of gait. One, two, three, four, five... One, two, three, four, five, six. Which I just think is just lovely. Again, very charming, These little personal touches. Gorgeous. So that's it. Tesla's asleep, isn't he? God. Literally one of the most scaredy cats in the world. And yet you can hammer one of the most destructive and all-encompassing pieces of music into his face for 40 minutes. He'll just sleep, sleep in a little washing basket. Lovely. Um, that's it. Andy, the last cat's chats with you in the room. Wow, you probably will be in bed when these air in future. I'll be there for one. <laughs> well, that would be what a treat that would be. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed that, like I said, you can chuck in some money for a ticket on the links that below the, the link that's below. Um, like and subscribe. Um, there will be another concert in two weeks, but I've, I've not even really thought about it. Such is the milestone of today, tomorrow and this week. We'll get that all done and then see what comes in the future. Bobster, how did you do with the subtitles? I guess we'll find out. Oh God, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> Terrifying. Well, I hope you weren't entirely led astray by the Valley of the Unhatched Chicks coming in the catacombs or something like that. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed playing for you. Um, best wishes for 2021 and hope to see you next time. Thanks very much for watching. Good night.